Georg Ferdinand Ludwig Philipp Cantor was a German mathematician. He invented set theory, which has become a fundamental theory in mathematics. Cantor established the importance of one-to-one -one correspondence between the members of two sets, defined infinite and well-ordered sets, and proved that the real numbers are more numerous than the natural numbers. In fact, Cantor's method of proof of this theorem implies the existence of an infinity of infinities. He defined the cardinal and ordinal numbers and their arithmetic. Cantor's work is of great philosophical interest, a fact of which he was well aware. Cantor's theory of transfinite numbers was originally regarded as so counterintuitive, even shocking, that it encountered resistance from mathematical contemporaries such as Leopold Kronecker and Henry Poincaré and later from Hermann Weyl and L. E. J. Brouwer, while Ludwig Wittgenstein raised philosophical objections. Cantor, a devout Lutheran, believed the theory had been communicated to him by God. Some Christian theologians saw Cantor's work as a challenge to the uniqueness of the absolute infinity in the nature of God, on one occasion, equating the theory of transfinite numbers with pantheism, a proposition that Cantor vigorously rejected. The objections to Cantor's work were occasionally fierce. Henry Poincaré referred to his ideas as of grave disease, infecting the discipline of mathematics, and Leopold Kronecker's public opposition and personal attacks included describing Cantor as a scientific charlatan, a renegade, and a corrupter of youth. Kronecker objected to Cantor's proofs that the algebraic numbers are countable, and that the transcendental numbers are uncountable, results now included in a standard mathematics curriculum, writing decades after Cantor's death. Wittgenstein lamented that mathematics is ridden through and through with the pernicious idioms of set theory, which he dismissed as utter nonsense, that is, laughable, and wrong. Cantor's recurring bouts of depression from 1884 to the end of his life have been blamed on the hostile attitude of many of his contemporaries. Though some have explained these episodes as probable manifestations of a bipolar disorder, the harsh criticism has been matched by later accolades. In 1904, the Royal Society awarded Cantor its Sylvester Medal, the highest honor it can confer for work in mathematics. David Hilbert defended it from its critics by declaring, No one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created, life, youth and studies gay or Cantor was born in the Western Merchant Colony in St. Petersburg, Russia, and brought up in the city until he was 11. Georg, the oldest of six children, was regarded as an outstanding violinist. His grandfather Franz Bohm was a well-known musician and soloist in a Russian imperial orchestra. Cantor's father had been a member of the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange when he became ill. The family moved to Germany in 1856, first to Wiesbaden then to Frankfurt, seeking winters milder than those of St. Petersburg. In 1860, Cantor graduated with distinction from the real Schüler in Darmstadt. His exceptional skills in mathematics, trigonometry in particular, were noted. In 1862, Cantor entered the University of Zurich. After receiving a substantial inheritance upon his father's death in 1863, Cantor shifted his studies to the University of Berlin. Attending lectures by Leopold Kronecker, Karl Weierstrass and Ernst Kummer, he spent the summer of 1866 at the University of Göttingen, then and later a center for mathematical research. Teacher and researcher Cantor submitted his dissertation on number theory at the University of Berlin in 1867. After teaching briefly in a Berlin girls' school, Cantori took up a position at the University of Halle, where he spent his entire career. He was awarded the requisite habilitation for his thesis, also on number theory, which he presented in 1869 upon his appointment at Halle. In 1874, Cantor married Valley Gutmann. They had six children, the last born in 1886. 
Cantor was able to support a family despite modest academic pay, thanks to his inheritance from his father. During his honeymoon in the Hartz Mountains, Cantor spent much time in mathematical discussions with Richard Dedekind, whom he had met two years earlier while on Swiss holiday. Cantor was promoted to extraordinary professor in 1872 and made full professor in 1879. To attain the latter rank at the age of 34 was a notable accomplishment, but Cantor desired a chair at a more prestigious university, in particular at Berlin, at that time the leading German university. However, his work encountered too much opposition for that to be possible. Kronecker, who headed mathematics at Berlin until his death in 1891, became increasingly uncomfortable with the prospect of having Cantor as a colleague perceiving him as a corrupter of youth, for teaching his ideas to a younger generation of mathematicians. Worse yet, Kronecker, a well-established figure within the mathematical community and Cantor's former professor, disagreed fundamentally with the thrust of Cantor's work. Kronecker, now seen as one of the founders of the constructive viewpoint in mathematics, disliked much of Cantor's set theory because it asserted the existence of sets satisfying certain properties, without giving specific examples of sets whose members did indeed satisfy those properties. Cantor came to believe that Kronecker's stance would make it impossible for him ever to leave Halle. In 1881, Cantor's Halle colleague Eduard Heine died, creating a vacant chair. Halle accepted Cantor's suggestion that it be offered to Dieter Kind, Heinrich M., Weber and Franz Mertens, in that order, but each declined the chair after being offered it. Friedrich Wangerain was eventually appointed, but he was never close to Cantor. In 1882, the mathematical correspondence between Cantor and Richard Dedekind came to an end, apparently as a result of Dedekind declining the chair at Halle. Cantor also began another important correspondence with Gostar Mittagleffler in Sweden, and soon began to publish in Mittagleffler's journal Acta Mathematica. But in 1885, Mittagleffler was concerned about the philosophical nature and new terminology in a paper Cantor had submitted to Acta. He asked Cantor to withdraw the paper from Acta while it was in proof, writing that it was about 100 years too soon. Cantor complied, but then curtailed his relationship and correspondence with Mittagleffler, writing to a third party. Had Mittagleffler had his way, I should have to wait until the year 1984, which to me seemed too great a demand. But of course I never want to know anything again about Acta Mathematica. Cantor suffered his first known bout of depression in 1884. Criticism of his work weighed on his mind. Every one of the 52 letters he wrote to Mittagleffler in 1884 mentioned Kronecker. A passage from one of these letters is revealing of the damage to Cantor's self-confidence. I don't know when I shall return to the continuation of my scientific work. At the moment I can do absolutely nothing with it and limit myself to the most necessary duty of my lectures, how much happier I would be to be scientifically active, if only I had the necessary mental freshness. This crisis led him to apply to lecture on philosophy rather than mathematics. He also began an intense study of Elizabethan literature thinking there might be evidence that Francis Bacon wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. This ultimately resulted in two pamphlets. Published in 1896 and 1897, Cantor recovered soon thereafter, and subsequently made further important contributions, including his diagonal argument and theorem. However, he never again attained the high level of his remarkable papers of 1874-84. He eventually sought and achieved a reconciliation with Kronecker. Nevertheless, the philosophical disagreements and difficulties dividing them persisted. In 1890, Cantor was instrumental in founding the Deutsche Mathematiker für Einigung and chaired its first meeting in Halle in 1891 where he first introduced his diagonal argument. His reputation was strong enough, despite Kronecker's opposition to his work, 
to ensure he was elected as the first president of this society. Setting aside the animosity Kronecker had displayed towards him, Cantor invited him to address the meeting. But Kronecker was unable to do so because his wife was dying from injuries sustained in a skiing accident at the time. Late years after Cantor's 1884 hospitalization, there is no record that he was in any sanatorium again until 1899. Soon after that second hospitalization, Cantor's youngest son Rudolf died suddenly, and this tragedy drained Cantor of much of his passion for mathematics. Cantor was again hospitalized in 1903. One year later, he was outraged and agitated by a paper presented by Julius Kuhnig at the Third International Congress of Mathematicians. The paper attempted to prove that the basic tenets of transfinite set theory were false. Since the paper had been read in front of his daughters and colleagues, Cantor perceived himself as having been publicly humiliated, although Ernst Semelo demonstrated less than a day later that Koenig's proof had failed. Cantor remained shaken, and momentarily questioning God. Cantor suffered from chronic depression for the rest of his life for which he was excused from teaching on several occasions and repeatedly confined in various sanatoria. The events of 1904 preceded a series of hospitalizations at intervals of two or three years. He did not abandon mathematics completely, however, lecturing on the paradoxes of set theory to a meeting of the Deutsche Mathematiker Vereinigung in 1903, and attending the International Congress of Mathematicians at Heidelberg in 1904. In 1911, Cantor was one of the distinguished foreign scholars invited to attend the 500th anniversary of the founding of the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Cantor attended, hoping to meet Bertrand Russell, whose newly published Principia Mathematica repeatedly cited Cantor's work, but this did not come about. The following year, St. Andrews awarded Cantor an honorary doctorate, but illness precluded his receiving the degree in person. Cantor retired in 1913, living in poverty and suffering from malnourishment during World War I. The public celebration of his 70th birthday was cancelled because of the war. He died on January 6, 1918 in the sanatorium where he had spent the final year of his life.